Are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuele Tini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to another episode, and today we are jumping again, going round round the globe. We are going now to a place which is dear to my heart, which I visited, and an history of restoration and conservation, which has impressed the world. So I'm here with uh, Larissa Sosa from Gorongosa National Park. Thank you so much, Larissa, for being here. Hi, Samuel. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be able to talk about myself and about conservation, about Gorongosa specifically, and yeah, to share my experience in general. Thank you so much, Larissa, for coming. And as I said, the work in Gorongosa, it has been, it has astonished the world. It's been a, one of the best known example of how to restore environment and now also to balance communities and conservation. But before that, you know, we are very curious now to understand who is Larissa and especially, you know, having a woman as one of the leaders, you know, in this effort of restoration. So if you could present a bit yourself. Yeah, um, so I'm Larissa, as I said, I am 31 years old. I am trained in public relations and management. Um, I studied in Mozambique first, and then I did my bachelor's degree in Finland, uh, which was also very interesting, very cold country, uh, especially for me coming from a very hot place such as Mozambique, going to the opposite direction. But it was very interesting to be able to, to learn and, and see things uh, on the other side of the world. And then I came back to Mozambique in 2012 which I decided to come back and give back and see what, how I could contribute better back in, in my country, which was very exciting for me. I started working and at the same time, I decided to do my master's degree. Uh, so I did an MBA, master's in business administration in Africa University in Zimbabwe. But yeah, I've always tried to, 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 to do and, and see things uh, in a diverse way so that's why this um, very spread out education background when I finished my my MBA I started working at a demining company uh, called the Halo Trust uh, which I was managing uh, the location in, in Shimoyo which was also very exciting very fun and then I went on to working with education which then twisted and uh, uh, went to the other direction, which led me to get to conservation and to Gorongosa National Park, um, which was very exciting. And I'm, I'm very glad I did that. And I'm a person who believes in destiny. So it was very exciting for me to end up in conservation, which I am still um, today. I started working in the park, um, actually doing education. I co-founded the girls education program which is under the human development sector uh, in the park so the park has two big objectives which is to protect the biodiversity alongside the human development so we need to make sure that there is development that there is sustainability and that the people that live around the national park are also catered for so that they are the ones who are the stewardess. They are the ones who are making sure that there is sustainability. Because as most of us are coming from the outside, and so we need to make sure the people who are from those areas understand why it is important to uh, conserve, to preserve. And in most cases, especially in Africa, these are very rural areas, which don't have basic education, basic health, uh, basic livelihoods and alternatives. And so that's uh, where we put a lot of focus uh, to make sure that there is this uh, so-called sustainability for conservation at the end of the day. Wow, you are doing a, an incredible job, Larissa. And it's really interesting. I really appreciate also, you know, your very diverse uh, educational background from Europe to other African countries and your passion also. I really like what you said, you know, the two pillars, the biodiversity, the conservation, but also the human development. And my, my question is going a bit there, you know, before, because I'm sure many people are not really familiar with Gorongosa. And then 
that's why that's why we need also to to discuss a bit the story and it will it is a wonderful story the importance of conservation especially in this moment where africa is growing it is the continent of the future we are the continent of the future we have a big heritage in natural resources and biodiversity and we are one of the biggest carbon sink either as here in kenya you there in mozambique and all over africa the congo and others. so how important is conservation for our continent nowadays it's not our importance of how important it is because this should be in everyone's agenda so it it's how big of a priority you are putting but it should always be under our agenda because conservation is, is a part of us if we are not conserving if we are not making sure that there is a, a an earth a planet for us to live in then we are not doing anything for our survival so conservation should always be there and when i say putting it as a priority is uh, what i mean is that we need to make sure that basic needs are catered for before we can consider conservation and as you said we as africans we have other challenges ahead of conservation so we have people not catered for we have people who are hungry we have people who don't have jobs we have people who have who are sick and so how are these being catered for before we can tackle conservation so that's why we in gorongoza uh, do these two important things alongside which is making sure that the people who need who have these needs are catered for first and then we also include um, conservation as one of the priorities so if we have people who have food on the table who are educated who have health care um, catered for then they are able to then uh, put conservation on the table as well and if you can get money doing conservation then that's a, a triple effect and that's what we're trying to do now is putting this uh, aspect of income so how can people do conservation and at the same time being able to get an income and have an alternative livelihood and one of the examples that we are doing very well is is the coffee and the honey activities that we're doing uh, uh, along in the park and the the coffee for example we have the idea of uh free storing this forest which is um up in mount gorongosa which was one of the biggest tropical forests that we have in the country and so how can we do that and we also need to realize what destroyed so what were the causes for people to cut down these trees in this area and so after analyzing that uh, one of the biggest reasons was poverty so people were doing that to make sure that they they had they earn a living and of course there's other cases of commercial uh, farming as well but the main was because of subsistence farming and so how do we tackle that and so we started uh, seeing different ideas and experimenting and coffee was one that is working very well which is we are planting native trees and as well as planting coffee under the shade so this is a shade grown coffee and so people have to plant the native trees so that the coffee can grow beneath it and they can get money from the coffee and so this has been a, a very interesting experience and people are, are really uh, enjoying they getting money from it and they they we can see a difference we can see developments going on now uh, up in that area and it's very exciting times that people are are, are now putting conservation uh, on the top of their list so I, i think that's how we see the importance of conservation and sustainability and as an african i think uh, now more we are seeing conservation as not something for other people to do but is everyone everyone's duty to do so and um as a national park we also see tourism as one of the the ways to ensure sustainability and uh normally in places like this it's always been said that it's for foreigners to come and explore and do these things and we trying to see things differently and making sure that these people come and sit in a in a safari jeep and do a safari and look uh, at a, an elephant and for them to understand and and strengthen this idea of what's going on and 
why are we at the end of the day doing this this conservation and what are the benefits of it and so you actually have to involve and engage uh, everyone in the process and it's it's something that we call um, that it's in fashion conservation is in fashion now everyone has to do it <laughs> if we want to make sure that there is that there is green in the next 10 20 years then we need to do things now definitely i i think larissa you have touched the point i mean you have i think the the curiosity of people on the other side they are listening to us i say mm, coffee elephants conservation community mozambique gorongosa so can you tell a bit the history of the park, the history of the project and the restoration? And then we, we go a bit deeper in, in also the community and power and livelihood. So yeah, Gorongosa is right in the center of Mozambique. Uh, we are one of the, the oldest national parks. So it was declared in 1960. At the time, the Portuguese were leading that. And uh, yeah, so along the years, after Mozambique got independent in 75, there was a civil war until about 1994, which were very hard years for Mozambique in general. And uh, the center of Mozambique, especially because this was a civil war between two main parties, uh, Sofrelimo and Renamo. And that is an area that is considered to be the opposition party. And so it was um, a lot more affected and about 90% of the biodiversity, uh, especially fauna was destroyed. So as you said, when you went there, there were basically no animals. You couldn't see elephants. You couldn't see the big animals. You couldn't see the baboons. You couldn't, yeah. So it was um, because of the war, it was uh, very destroyed. And um People were killing animals to eat. They were killing animals to sell their trophies, to buy uh, firearms. And they were uh, killing animals for space. So there was uh, not only a civil war, but as well a war against everything else that was there. And so for us, there were very hard years. And after that, uh, the government of Mozambique tried to see how it would um, be possible to restore this, this paradise at its it's called and um, at the time President Chisano, who was uh, also very linked with Nelson Mandela, who always spoke about doing combined conservation and the human development. And so um, Chisano, then president, invited Greg Carr uh, from the Carr Foundation to come and see the park and see what he could do. And in 2004, 2005, um, Mr. Greg Carr came to Mozambique, visited the park and also fell in love. And he decided to come and help restore and co-manage uh, Gorongosa National Park. And so that's how the, the, the whole restoration project started. And since then, Gorongosa has been able to get back animals and re restore the areas that were destroyed and uh, yeah, and it's, it's been a, a long journey, but it's very exciting that we have always had this idea of uh, working on conservation as well as on the people uh, because you can't separate that. And so I think this, this has been one of the, the very important and good things that we have done. We really, really um, hope that people can see this as an example. I've seen also you are being featured in wonderful National Geographic stories. The conservation was wonderful. I've seen that iconic species like leopard, they are back. Uh, wild dogs are back. You know, the famous Casa dos Leões, you know, the house of lion, now hosts again lions. <laughs> no. It really has been amazing, the work in conservation. Maybe it's something that touched the art and souls of people to see how animals that were no longer seen now they are coming back and nature is is coming back but as you say that this um, restoration has been also possible because of the other leg the leg of the community the one also you are there you know I, i'm really also working and fostering you know especially with community girls empowerment and uh, you know the education for girls which i think is really important can you talk about the social side, the community empowerment, the livelihood? Because that is the core, I think, 
on how we can have a win-win situation for conservation. We work on, on specific things, which is making sure that uh, people have livelihoods, um, that they have an income so that they can feed themselves. We also work directly with the Ministry of Health to make sure that we are catering for health care and uh, facilities in terms of infrastructure. We do mobile brigades around the communities, which are far away from healthcare centers. We make sure that there is um, better nutrition using the local food and what they have locally. Uh, we also encourage um, community gardens, school gardens, just to make sure that um, there is no malnutrition in these areas. But we also work with education. And uh, in education, we first focused on girls' education, which I said uh, I co-founded the, the project, which is called Girls Clubs. And the idea was that girls are the ones that are most marginalized in terms of education. And they are not put as a priority. Um, they get married early, they get uh, early pregnancies. And so um, the idea was to make sure that girls are educated because when they are educated, they make sure that the next generation is also educated. So there is also the sustainability factor where we, we focus on empowerment. And so uh, working with girls, working with women in general was something very important from the start. And um, in conservation, it's all also said that women are the ones that most destroy nature because they want to open fields to make sure that they feed their kids, for example. And so uh, working with these uh, women in the community to ensure that they know about conservation, but they also need to feed their they children at the end of the day. So trying to make them understand the importance of conservation is something vital. And we making sure that um, we're not only working with girls, so the younger generation, but also the women who are old, who have had early pregnancies, have had uh, early marriages, because they are the ones who can give uh, the examples of uh, what wasn't going well. And they can also learn and really focus on what can be a better future for their own children they own daughters at the end of the day. And so it's working with these women to make sure that they can get independence because before they didn't have a voice, before they couldn't make decisions on their own. And so if they are not able to work together with their partners, that they are part and engage in, in this um, family and relationship. And that's, that's how we are trying to make sure that there is a more equity in everything we do, and there is also the sustainability factor um, uh, while working with, with women empowerment, because there's cases of when you empower the woman a lot more, and then we, we have another problem of, of equality. And so it's to make sure that we're working with both. And we also are making sure that there is uh, equality in our program. So in education, we also work with both boys and girls. Uh, in the girls clubs, there's not only girls, but there's also boys. So they have to be a part of the change. We can't just say we are empowering women and just uh, focusing on women and not making sure the men is also there to, to be a part of this change. Um, behavior change is something that takes generations. So the park has been there since 2000, well, the restoration project uh, uh, is what I mean, for a long time. And we, we have started seeing change. We have started seeing the impact of all these activities that we've been doing, but it takes a generation for you to see this big change, this, this behavior change. I want now to go a bit there because, you know, that is what impact stories. Uh, something that you have noticed, you have mentioned the coffee, you have mentioned uh, Annie, uh, which is also something I am also doing here in, in this part of the world. It's very important for conservation. And, you know, the stories about this now is from 2004, you know, it will be almost 20 years soon. Within this year, if you can tell us a bit of some impact stories, something that you have seen and you can witness on how you know the project and the work of the national park is transforming yeah. communities so as i said the park has two main objectives which is protecting the biodiversity 
which we are we are very happy to say that it's uh, the restoration project has uh, been successful. At some point, we can say that we are no longer working in the restoration because we are we have successfully done that in terms of of, of fauna and and restoring the biodiversity that was there uh, during this time, which is. Is, is very, very good and positive for us. And um, the human development part, uh, we also started doing alongside that. And, but as I said, it takes generations to change. And you just said, it's about 20 years now since we, we started working in, in the Gorongosa project. But we can see a lot of changes. And as I said, um, it's basically focusing on uh, health, education, and livelihoods. And so what kind of developments can we see in education wise, we can see a lot more changes in terms of girls education, because a lot more girls are being allowed to go to school, they're being allowed to continue school, because it's very common that in the earlier grades or grade one to four, there is a lot more girls in the classes, and as you go up the grades, there is less and less girls. And we are happy to say that there is a lot more girls continuing with education. There is less early marriages. Um, but we also um, can say that the government is also helping a lot in that sense, because in 2019, the government announced a law that is a crime now to marry an early child. And so the, the law is now on our side and it's easier to encourage and raise awareness in that sense. We've also been very, very happy to, to see uh, changes in the health of the kids. There is a lot less malnutrition. There is a lot less diseases like cholera because people are taking care of themselves. They know how to do these things. They know how to, to cook nutritious meals for their the kids. And they do that by using their own local uh, material that they actually do in their garden, which is very, very positive. In terms of livelihoods, we see people, long ago, people were living around these areas. So they were doing poaching in very small amounts because it was just for consumption. But now with awareness raising, with uh, conservation education, uh, a lot more, they are now understanding if they kill these animals, there won't be tourism and there won't be money for them at the end of the day. And so with this education and cycle of thinking and reasoning, we are able to provide them with alternative um, income uh, activities, such as arts and craft. There's uh, women and, and, uh, in the communities who are being taught to do sewing. There's women who have been taught to do uh, different arts, to sell. They're doing honey. They're doing coffee. They're doing, um, uh, we are providing technical assistance for the contact farmers. So the, the farmers who um, are the ones who are model farmers in the communities are right, being given technical assistance to help them uh, have better harvest, um, have better, uh, uh, how to better organize their yield, how to use hybrid um, seeds. So all these little tips that improves their they harvest so that they can not only have subsistence farming, but they can have a surplus that they can sell and have income. Now you can see kids with backpacks because their parents can afford to buy that. They no longer using those sack bags to go to school. They now have books. They have better clothing. They now have cell phones. Uh, most of these areas are very rural, so they don't have electricity from the normal electricity uh, companies, but they have solar panels, so they're buying radio. So this is how you see development. They see improvement in their homes. They have uh, roofs that are made of, of zinc, as you mentioned. Um, they have uh, houses built of cement nowadays. So this is how you see development. And we, we have started to see this, which is very exciting for us. And then I'm sure, you know, from the going on foot, somebody is going for a picky pick, you know, a motorbikes. I, I can see the story, you know, most of the things I relate with because it's something that you see the transformation in the community. When something is unlocking change and working, some of the discussion you had, you know, when you go to school, you see at the still for grade four, the girls are there, less there. 
the diseases, the honey, the coffee. And I like the image, you know, the kids now go to school with backpacks. And it's really something that you can see from even from a stranger point of view, they see the, the community is moving. Now we have seen, you know, now the animals are coming back. Uh, the tourists now, I, I think now you are full lodge. Uh, and then even if not two, I don't, I don't recall now. Not. And then, so you have now the community side is working. Animals are back. Leopard is back. Huge herd of elephants, they are back. Now, we have seen now the positiveness, the work there, which are now the way forward. You know, if you see... How do you see the future? Which is the way forward again for Gorongosa? How to maintain and sustain and even build up momentum even more for, for the world? And, and also, you know, the challenges that yeah. you foresee. Well, I think, as you said, it's about maintaining and making sure there's sustainability in things that we do. Along these years, there's a lot of things that we've been trying and we have failed. And you try again something else and you learn experiences from countries like Kenya, for example, that has been doing conservation for a lot more than Mozambique. And so I think this um, being able to share experiences and learn from other places has been something very, very important and a good a way to proceed. And it's always said that it's easy to start something, but to maintain is something else. And so that's that's where we're focusing and working on now is to making sure we're maintaining that and improving uh, in whatever we, we are really doing. Um, I think one of the challenges we have been having is how we can make sure that uh, the community development is also going alongside with sustainability because we can see that people are improving their lives, they getting these better things, better infrastructure. But we also need to make sure that the, the conditions are going to be maintained and they will be sustainable. And so uh, how can we do that? Uh, Gorongosa National Park is at the moment working in these different projects and programs through funding. So we need to make sure there is funding for these activities to be able to carry on. And so I think um, uh, challenge number one would be funding. Uh, we always working and engaging with new partners. Um, as you said, we, we work with uh, National Geographic. We've been doing a lot of documentaries, movies about the work that we've been doing. And we're very happy to share with the world and um, see where people can engage and also learn from what we have been doing so that they can replicate in their own areas. Another challenge we've had uh, for a long time and still do is how can we try and coexist with the animals? So the park is very big and uh, we don't have fences around the park where there is like a direct link with the communities. And so we've had human wildlife conflicts and we've been trying to work around that using science, using uh, experiences. And we've been using this very interesting approach, uh, which was actually first done in Kenya, which is the beehive fences, where the the, we put uh, alongside the main crossings of the elephants uh, because they go into the communities to eat um, in the farms. And so we try and put fences of beehives along these crossings so that they don't cross along to these uh, communities. And this is, is, has been something that is working and we, we are trying to make sure that that stays that way. And then we have also a wild dogs or painted uh, dogs which is something that was not in the park for about 30 years. And we were able to successfully reintroduce them, which we were very happy. Um, and they also like run for kilometers and kilometers every day. And so sometimes they're found in communities, but they, we haven't had cases of them biting people. They normally just like the domestic animals. And so um, that is also another challenge. So yeah, we, we just work with ongoing challenges like this and uh, trying to maintain this project going. You know, human wildlife, animal strain in areas, uh, it is the, the, the biggest complaint. And you know, the beehives and the bee, you know, usually they send me when an elephant see a bee run away. <laughs> so this is one thing. And, and I know the wild dogs has been, they are notorious because they move a lot. Uh, they can be also stray outside the park and the world. And of course, the challenges and opportunities. And I'm very pleased also you are giving out and share your experience in our a small podcast that is trying to discuss and see and bring into the world interesting story, especially from our continent of impact and sustainability. So 
Uh, we are going now to the end, Larissa. And then I want to call, you know, you are a woman, you know, you are what they call the Mujer Mozambicana, no? I remember the day of Mujer Mozambicana that was celebrated when I was there. And, uh, and then, you know, the leadership of women and, um, and especially the work you are doing is really wonderful and uh, particularly also in, uh, something that full the arts and soul of people. And then I want to ask you, I mean, your, which is your call for action, a, a message that you want to leave to our audience that is listening to us? Yeah, I think <laughs> there's many calls of action, but I will um, focus on me as a young woman, um, African, who's working in, in conservation and education, which is things that I, I believe and I have passion for. The African continent is very big. Uh, we are about 20% of world population, and we just keep on growing. And the majority of this population is young. And it's up to us to do something. It's up to us to do something now. And me talking as a woman, we can have a lot of challenges working in specific conservation and away from uh, everything else. A bit challenging in the sense that we are away. If we have family, if we have a husband, kids, and to be working away from, from home can be hard, but it's not something that is impossible. If you believe in something, then give it your all work towards something that is brighter for everyone else and uh, there is no thing that you can uh, focus more on at the moment uh, if it's not becoming green and becoming a better version of yourself and if you can do that with a smile on your face then there is no no other thing that uh, would make a world a better place wow Thank you so much. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much, Larissa, for this wonderful message. And um, we are very pleased. And as usual, I say, you know, maybe in the future, we'll have a second episode in maybe a year or so to listen and see how we have progressed. It was a real pleasure and honor having you. And thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, I really hope that people can um, get inspired by all these different stories that you're telling the world and inspiring people by by having these conversations and yeah if you're interested in gorongoza please um, visit us at gorongoza.org or .com and yeah you can read and see about us more there and visit gorongoza of course <laughs> in mozambique as well and visit gorongoza <laughs> are you satisfied after this wonderful episode let's continue together our sustainability journey